In Hollywood movies, secret agents are often portrayed as cold-blooded killers. But is this anything like the reality? Should intelligence agencies have a license to kill? This is the University of the Netherlands. On a late Tuesday afternoon in January 2010, two men in shorts carrying tennis rackets in their hands and with white towels draped around their shoulders paced the lobby of the luxury Al Bustan Hotel in Dubai. They were waiting for someone. For these men were not here to play tennis. In fact, they were part of a 27-person hit squad that had been sent to Dubai by the Israeli intelligence service Mossad to assassinate a senior Hamas commander, Mahmoud al Mabou. Mabou checked into the hotel under a false name later that afternoon. As he entered the hotel elevator, the two tennis players rushed to squeeze into the elevator with him. They followed him down the corridor and noted down his room number, and then they booked themselves into the room opposite. When Mabou returned to his room later that evening, he was met by four Israeli assassins. Exactly what took place inside that room is still a little uncertain. According to the official police reports, Mabu was injected with a drug that caused rapid muscle paralysis and then suffocated with a pillow. But since then, doubt has been cast on the, this official cause of death. All that we know for sure is that Mabu did not leave his hotel room alive. Once the Dubai authorities did piece together who was behind the murder, a major diplomatic scandal ensued. The 27-strong hit team has, had used fake European and Australian passports to enter the country, and many of the countries whose passports had been forged protested to the Israeli authorities. But it is telling, however, that the diplomatic protests of Israel's allies were about the use of fake passports and not about the killing itself. For this was 2010, almost a decade after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, and by now, targeted killing or assassination had become an accepted counter-terrorism practice. Whilst these scenes in Dubai may seem like something from a James Bond movie, Bond is, of course, a fantasy. Real intelligence officers working for Britain's MI6 do not have a license to kill and their jobs are, of course, far less glamorous. A typical analyst in an intelligence agency will spend most of their working lives sitting behind a desk, performing painstaking analysis by piecing together fragmentary information and writing dry, bureaucratic reports and assessments that probably nobody reads. Unfortunately, they don't tend to jump out of aeroplanes or sip vodka martinis at high-stakes casino games as we're used to seeing in the movies. But as this opening story demonstrates, some intelligence agencies around the world do kill people. And over the last 20 years since 9-11, intelligence agencies like the American CIA or Israel's Mossad have killed more frequently and in ever more sophisticated ways. Should intelligence agencies have a license to kill? And what are the consequences when they are asked not just to watch the world, but also to change it. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Intelligence, in national security at least, is the process of collecting, analyzing, and disseminating relevant information that can help inform the process of decision making. The key difference between intelligence and information is that raw information has gone through this process and what comes out at the other end is something that is useful for decision makers or intelligence consumers, as they are known within the business. A fact is innocent until someone wants it, wrote the novelist Don DeLillo. Then it becomes intelligence. These consumers of intelligence range widely. First, and most obviously, the president or prime minister of a nation is usually the most important consumer of intelligence. In theory, the decisions they take should be guided by the best information or intelligence provided by their intelligence agencies. But there are many other intelligence consumers, from government ministers to military generals to law enforcement officers and all sorts of other security practitioners. 
Increasingly, we, the general public, are also intelligence consumers, being made aware, for example, of cybersecurity threats so that we can better protect ourselves from them and help to build a more resilient society. Of course, another important feature of intelligence and intelligence agencies is secrecy. These agencies keep secrets, and they try to steal secrets from other states, organizations, or individuals. The secrets they keep can include their intelligence assessments and reports, and in particular, the sources and the methods that are used to make those assessments. Protecting human sources, those agents on the ground who often risk their lives by betraying their organization or country to provide information to your intelligence service, is one of the most important justifications for state secrecy. But along with intelligence sources and methods, some intelligence agencies also conduct operations in secret. This includes targeted killing, but it could also include paramilitary operations, instigating coups, providing financial support to certain political groups, and conducting secret propaganda campaigns. The common denominator of, of all of these types of activities is that they are all activities that involve not just spying on the world, but actively attempting to change it. The term we use to describe these active types of secret state operations is covert action. Not all intelligence agencies engage in covert action, and certainly not all are involved in targeted killing. Unsurprisingly, the countries whose intelligence agencies tend to engage in covert action are also the countries that have engaged in targeted killing. Israel, the United States, Russia, and Iran, to name perhaps the most obvious examples. Now, targeted killing raises particular dilemmas for an intelligence agency, both practical and moral. What does it mean for an intelligence agency to engage in targeted killing? And how does that change the nature of what an intelligence agency is for? For that, we need to look at history. Believe it or not, until 9-11, the United States Central Intelligence Agency wasn't particularly good at assassination. Of course, Hollywood movies and conspiracy theories have led many people to think otherwise, but the reality is quite different. Perhaps the most famous example of CIA assassination plots were their series of increasingly outlandish efforts to murder Fidel Castro. Pro proposed methods for assassinating the Cuban leader included exploding cigars and a poisoned wetsuit tailor-made for Castro, who was, of course, a habitual smoker and seasoned scuba diver. The CIA even enlisted the Mafia at one point to assist them in their efforts. But none of these plots, crucially, were ever successfully carried out. In the 1970s, the discovery of these plots led to a public outcry and a series of congressional inquiries. The ensuing scandal prompted President Gerald Ford to sign an executive order banning the United States government from engaging in political assassination. Whilst the CIA were involved in numerous other types of covert operation after this public backlash in the 1970s and the political crackdown that followed, they refrained from using assassination. Until 9-11, that is. In July 2001, just a few short months prior to the 9-11 attacks, the outgoing US ambassador to Israel, Martin Indyk, reprimanded the Israelis for their use of targeted killing during the Second Intifada. The United States government is against assassinations, he remarked. We do not support that. The events of September the 11th, of course, would lead to a dramatic reversal of this position by the United States. As the head of the CIA's counterterrorism center at the time later reflected, there was a before 9-11 and an after 9-11. After 9-11, the gloves come off. In the space of just a few short months, the United States shifted from being opposed to Israel's targeted killing program to adopting it as the model practice for their own counterterrorism efforts. The CIA carried out the first armed drone strike in history just a month later in a failed attempt to assassinate the Taliban leader, Mullah Omar, who escaped the strike. 
Along with it being the first armed drone strike in history and the fact that the CIA failed to hit their target, there was another interesting feature to this episode in that it was conducted by the CIA, an intelligence agency, and not the United States military. Who the fuck did that? were the words of the United States general in charge of the air campaign in Afghanistan. The military was planning to invade Afghanistan, and they had no idea that the CIA was planning this drone strike. The general threatened to call off the entire opening invasion campaign unless he was given control of the CIA's new secret weapon. In the years that followed, a bureaucratic war would ensue between the CIA and the US Department of Defense over who should have control of the targeted killing drone warfare program. The CIA's use of targeting killing, however, would expand exponentially in the years to come. The US military was able to lead airstrikes in active war zones like Afghanistan and later Iraq. But the CIA wasn't bound by the same rules of war and could operate in secrecy using their drones. They expanded the use of this new tactic into places like Pakistan and Yemen, where the United States military was officially not present. A US intelligence agency launching an airstrike without the knowledge of the US military just hours before an invasion was, of course, an operational problem. But the CIA's use of drones raised much more fundamental questions. Should a civilian intelligence agency be tasked with performing military-style operations? This renewed license to kill in the context of the war on terror raised fundamental questions about what an intelligence agency is for. Becoming killers changes an intelligence agency. As the former deputy director of the CIA, John McLaughlin, later reflected, when people say to me, it's not a big deal, I say to them, have you ever killed anyone? It is a big deal. You start to think about things differently. Targeted killing transformed the CIA from a more traditional intelligence agency whose primary mission is to collect and analyze intelligence to something that more closely resembled a paramilitary organization. Flying drones meant the CIA required military facilities like access to air bases around the globe. It required personnel with military experience. It required military technology, predator drones and precision missiles. It required competing for military budgets. Perhaps the most profound change to the CIA and its organizational culture after 9-11 was its shift in focus away from strategic intelligence and towards counterterrorism. These two things are fundamentally different types of activity. Whilst traditional strategic intelligence work, such as producing estimates of Soviet military strength, requires patient, discreet, and largely passive analytical work, counterterrorism often requires violence. Even the language of the intelligence business changed. Certain analysts became targeters, whose job it was to identify terrorist suspects often marking them for death by drone strike. Along with transforming the identity of intelligence agencies, this shift towards violent covert operations also brought controversy. Killing or torturing in secret tends to do that. Not since the 1970s had the agency faced such public and political criticism. Numerous congressional inquiries, revelations by whistleblowers, and major works of investigative journalism once again raised controversial CIA activities to the level of national trauma. Here, then, was another paradox produced by 9-11. The CIA became both more secretive, whilst at the same time it became more exposed thanks to its use of controversial tactics like killing it became more exposed to significant public scrutiny. Watching the world is often much less controversial than trying to change it. So should intelligence agencies have a license to kill? Or should the monopoly of violence be left to militaries? Since the Second World War, governments have asked their intelligence services to perform covert operations, including assassinations, because they believe they are cheaper, more effective, 
and less open to public scrutiny and controversy than conventional military operations. But the reality is that many of these operations have gone awry. And when they go wrong, they are usually exposed and can bring significant public controversy in their wake. At a time when public trust in governments, and especially in secret intelligence agencies, is at an all-time low, is the reputational risk worth the operational payoff? And once an intelligence agency turns to violent operations, is there a chance that their original purpose gets lost? Perhaps it is time for intelligence agencies like the CIA to attempt to change the world less, but to try to understand it more. Thank you for listening.